Did you know the best seeds for your garden don't come from the nursery? In fact, the seeds that will create the most robust and delicious fruits and vegetables come directly from your garden. This is because they are uniquely adapted to your growing conditions, better than anything you can buy from a fancy catalog or website. Through the magic of seed saving, it is quite possible to have the garden of your dreams. The best part is, saving your own seeds is surprisingly easy and fun. With a bit of instruction, anyone can become a seed saving superstar. Let us teach you how in our free seed saving webinar. Just text SEEDS to 33444 to sign up or visit SeedSavingHacked.org for more information. That's SEEDS to 33444 or visit SeedSavingHacked.org. You're listening to the Urban Farm Podcast, your partner in the Grow Your Own Food revolution. Whether you've just been introduced to urban farming or you're a lifelong advocate, we're sure you'll leave feeling more informed, equipped, and empowered to dig deeper into the soil of your local food economy. With you every step of the way, here's your host, Greg Peterson. Today on the Urban Farm Podcast, we have Michael Matheson Miller of Poverty Inc. to talk about poverty in the world. Michael is a research fellow at the Acton Institute and the director and producer of Poverty, Inc., the movie. Previously, Michael was the director of media and director of programs international at the Acton Institute and has appeared in various videos, including Doing the Right Thing. Before coming to Acton, he taught philosophy and political science at Ave Marie College in Nicaragua and was the chair of the philosophy and theology department. Michael holds graduate degrees in philosophy, international development, and international business. He has lived and traveled in Europe, Asia, Africa, and Latin America, and speaks extensively on themes of international development, entrepreneurship, political economy, and moral philosophy. He has been featured on Fox Business, CNBC, numerous radio shows, and published in the New York Post, the Washington Times, the LA Daily News, the Detroit News, and Real Clear Politics. Welcome to the show today, Michael. Thanks so much for having me. Good to be with you. Absolutely. So I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took to get where you're at now? Well, you know, I, st- I mean, it, as far as the, this film goes, you know, this is these are things I had been interested for a while. Uh-huh. But um, I guess I could say that. So I, I graduated from University of Notre Dame, and I kind of. I probably had some of the lowest grades in, in, in college. I figured, I think the only people who had lower grades than me went to the, the NBA or the NFL or something. Oh, there you go. So, uh, so I, anyway, I ended up getting a, a, a job in Japan uh-huh. and uh, was teaching English there and learning Japanese. And then I started to kind of get serious about my studies. And, and uh, I actually learned, here's my advice right here. You can, you know, if you go to class and you study, uh-huh. you tend to get better grades than if you don't go to class. <laughs> yeah, there you go. But uh, so I started, you know, studying and, and ended up doing a, a graduate degree in, in international development at the Graduate School of International Development, and um, became interested in kind of questions of poverty and how we help poor people. And mm-hmm. I had studied philosophy and, and, and literature at Notre Dame, and so I had always kind of a philosophical questions. I remember I was thinking to myself, like, I really, I really need to to study philosophy again to be more serious about my my philosophy studies because right. I, I thought that a lot of the questions about poverty were not simply policy questions, but they were actually philosophical questions. And there is this sense that I, I, I didn't know how to articulate at the time, but I was disturbed, but I would call it like a social engineering approach about the way we think about poor people. It's, you know, we're going to mm. somehow, how we're going to save them, manip- manipulate them, save them, do things yeah. to them, you know, and that, you know, these kind of Western technocrats that we were going to have the answers to, to poverty. And a lot of times without actually asking how we, first of all, got wealthy in the first place, but also just, just the way we, we treated them. And so I thought they were kind of philosophical questions. So I ended up going to do a, a graduate degree in, in philosophical anthropology. What is oh, interesting. Uh-huh. Person. And I did that. I met, met my wife there when, when I was in graduate school. And so we did a couple things, and then ended up I got a job teaching philosophy and political science at a U.S. college that had a Nicaraguan branch campus. So we moved there. Oh, fun! And, 
Yeah, we lived there for three years. It was good fun. And then I said, okay, well, I'm going to go uh, go do something else. And so I, I actually got a, an opportunity to get a scholarship to study global business. So we moved to uh, Europe, uh, and to the French-Swiss border, and mm-hmm. was there, we were there for a year. And after that, while I was there, I met different people, and I ended up getting a job at Think Tank where I work, which is called the Acton Institute. Uh, and it just was kind of the combination of moral philosophy and theology on one side with business, economics, entrepreneurship, poverty on the other. It was all the things I had studied, all the things I had been thinking about kind of brought into one. So I've, I've, I've been at Acton for, for uh, about 11 years. Wow. And uh, we do a number of different things. We do, um, you know, it's kind of a, a broad area, but that, it's that focus of, of kind of economics and anthropology and, mm-hmm. and moral philosophy. And, and, so I, and so I live in West Michigan and, and, and live here with my family, and my wife and I have six children. And, and on a farm, right? Well, a little farm, right? Yeah, <laughs> so we, we have about five acres. And uh, so I, I was saying I listened to some of uh, – you just uh, you, you had that interview with the orchardist, I think Michael Phillips' is name. Yeah, so yeah, I, exactly. I have a couple of his books and seen his video and some of the other people you've interviewed. So I'm, I'm very excited uh, to, to learn about how I can be a little bit more effective. But, yeah, we have some goats and hens and – a little vineyard and orchard and a garden. So uh, I had to, I had to laugh. So for those of us that live in cities, our little farms are, you know, a third of an acre or <laughs> two thousand square feet or a hundred square feet. So when you say you have a little farm and it's five acres, I'm green with envy. Right. <laughs> I think there's just it's the the human condition, right? I'm like, well, if it were twenty five acres, would be bigger. And it, yeah. if I had twenty five acres, I'd want fifty. And so yeah. It's just, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So how did you how did you stumble across this whole conversation about poverty and poverty aid groups and like that? Because it is I, I can see that it's, you know, very philosophical in nature, the the underpinnings of it. Mm-hmm. Well, like I said, so while I was studying development and then you know traveling and seeing different things, I. I was, as I said, bothered a little bit by this, what I, what I can call now a social engineering approach, a certain kind of technocratic approach, mm-hmm. um, and that, that shaped the way we did develop. And so this has been going around in, in my brain for a while. So the Acton Institute, we said, okay, let's do a project on poverty. So I ended up doing that and worked with a, some great, great uh, team members. And we did a number of projects around this and just kind of looked at how do we think about poverty and what we wanted to do with our film Poverty Inc. is really not so much challenge individual policies, but challenge the underlying assumptions about the way we engage poverty. And yeah. so the kind of underlying philosophical uh, force of this, which actually was influenced by my philosophical studies about the human person, is that we tend to treat poor people like objects, objects of our charity, objects of our pity, objects of our compassion, mm-hmm. instead of treating people uh, like subjects. And when I say subjects, I don't mean like subjects of the king or subjects of the queen. I mean subjects in that grammatical sense that we, we try to treat, we, we don't treat people like the protagonist of their own story of development. Right. And so we've kind of combined this objectification of poor people with a type of social engineering, right, that we're going to come in with policies and we're going to solve problems, usually through kind of top-down technocratic solutions. And it's it's that's combined with a type of, of humanitarianism where, you know, we're not so much thinking about human flourishing, but we're going to, you know, again, thinking about providing comfort. And we've, we so that underlying this model is we sometimes forget that, like, our job is not to do things to poor people. Right. We're, we're the bigger question is, you know, what do poor people need? Right. In order to be able to create prosperity in their own families and their own communities. And then how can we come alongside and help them? And so like the kind of dominant idea of, of foreign aid or charity, and you hear this actually from you know, political leaders, you hear from religious leaders, from celebrities, you know, things like, you know, if, if Europe and North America or if North American Christians or if, you know, all of these, these groups of people could get together we could raise, you know, $84 billion and we could eradicate extreme poverty forever. And the answer is, no, we couldn't because poor people are not poor because they lack stuff. Poor people are poor primarily because they are excluded from these institutions of justice that we take for granted, things like clear title to your land, like you Mm. know who owns the land you live on, right? right? Access to justice in the courts, 
right? I mean, Research of Governance in India did a study where it takes an average of 20 years to get your court case heard, right? So Holy people are just- Holy shamoles. Yeah, it's not good, right? So, so people are locked out from these basic kind of ability to participate in the formal economy, and we can talk about those in more detail if you want. But, but, and so, and so, what's happened is that we're, we seem to kind of ask the wrong questions. It's like us doing things to poor people and say, saying, okay, well, what do you actually need to prosper? Right. And so, how did how does that develop into uh, your? Poverty Inc. process. Well, you know, so and so in po like in Poverty Inc. in the film, as I said, we were trying to create a framework shift mm -hmm. of how we rethink things. So, so there's a number of things that we tried to do. One is, you know, we just tried to address this question about the subjective dimension of the person, and we did this in a couple of ways. One through, you know, through film, through the way we presented people, mm -hmm. uh, through the argument, through a host of other things. So, but. But one is to say, you know, to kind of highlight, to represent poor people, not as kind of objects, not as, not as somehow radically different from us, but that people like us, just in a different situation. So, for example, you know, even the way we tried to, to with ourselves, now, we probably didn't get this perfect, Greg, but our, our goal was, okay, how, when you think of kind of traditional poverty imagery, mm -hmm. right? It's usually highly evocative. There's a poor yeah. person suffering, and I'm trying to somehow kind of go to your emotions. Right. And 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 you're supposed to be the hero to come in and save. And so one of the things we try to do in the film, I mean, I don't think we did it perfectly, but as I said, but I think we tried to do it is to present poor people like us, like we would want to be presented. They're not. They're not somehow different from us. They're not objects to be manipulated or problems to be solved. They're mm -hmm. human beings who have something to say. And so that's that's one thing. And then two is I think we just wanted to show through different examples, whether it's foreign aid or private charity or non-governmental organizations or social entrepreneurs like Tom Shoes, mm -hmm. the many things that we're doing is that we're taking the, those are all kind of variations on a theme uh, that are doing something to poor people or for poor people instead of working with them. Yeah. And so, you know, th this it's. We're not. We're, so we're not. We wanted to kind of re restructure the question, like how do we actually participate and and think about how we engage with people and how would we would want to be engaged. So that that's kind of the philosophical underlying. And then, of course, there's also policy things too, right? Yeah. So, so for example, you know, some of the things we do in foreign aid. W one of the problems is that we take an emergency model or an emergency yeah. situation, and mm -hmm. we use that as the model for development. So sometimes I'll ask, like you know, and you could ask your your listeners, right? Many people. How many people have been to the developing world? And people raise their hands. You know. I said, okay, do you remember the first time you went to the developing world? And you get to say Sub-Saharan Africa or Latin America, Asia, and it's very poor. And mm -hmm. if you've grown up in the United States or Europe, you're kind of shocked by this because this is serious poverty. Right. And you know, this dirt floor, this leaky roof, and it's an emergency. And I always for say, for us, yeah, I think. It's a, right. Exactly. It's an emergency for us. It's an emergency for me and for you. But for those people who live there, that's a chronic situation. Right. And so what happens is we, we have all this emotion and we try to kind of solve the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and we use an emergency model to address actually long-term chronic problems of development, which are much more um, exclusion from institutions of justice than they are from not having enough stuff. Yeah. So our solution in the U.S. and I'm sure in other first world countries is to raise money and send them stuff. How does that impact the economies and the people in the, you know, in the third world countries that are receiving stuff? Well, you know, when, so I, I want to say this, and, and I probably should have said it earlier, but, you know, poverty is extremely complex, you know, yeah. and, and there's no single solution and good people can disagree. And, and so, you know, we're not, one of the things we're not, we're not trying to do in Poverty Inc. is somehow say like, you know, this is the solution to world poverty. What uh -huh. we're trying to do is question the underlying framework. And so, you know, in some cases, sending things, giving money can, can be helpful, mm -hmm. but we oftentimes neglect some of the negatives. So let me give you some of the examples of negatives. Uh -huh. You know, so, so for example, let's say you have an emergency situation, right? Uh, there's an earthquake, a tsunami, right? Immediate aid can actually be helpful. Right. Uh, so, but like as one person points out in our film, you know, in Haiti, they were, they gave away free rice, right? Well, 
for three years they were given a free rice. Right. So it wasn't an emergency anymore, and yet free rice, rice was being given away. So, but, but what happens is there's some negative impacts of aid. So like one of them, a, a Senegalese businessman named Malik Fall, he explained it this way. He said, aid has delayed the development of business in Africa. Yeah. He said it's kept Africa behind. Why? Because when, when things are given, free things are given, it actually crowds out local producers yeah. and local entrepreneurs and those things don't come in like, so some people will say, well, wait a minute. I mean, if the things are coming in for free, why don't they do something else? Well, they're not coming in like, you know, every Tuesday, right? They're coming in erratically. You yeah. can't predict it. There's not information. So farmers are, you know, planting a crop, everything's going, all of a sudden free stuff comes in. Uh -huh. Well, if you can't compete with free things. Right. And so it actually crowds out local business. Now, and it's not just, and this is really important, Greg, it's not just the immediate one farmer or the, the shoemaker or the or the, the person to, selling clothes. It's that it actually stalls the development of a commercial society, which is both business, but oh. also civil society, private associations. So it actually creates this long-term dependency. Mm -hmm. And so you, and so we give some examples in the film. So one of them is, um, you know, with, with agriculture. Mm -hmm. So what we do in the United States is we subsidize our, our agriculture and your listeners probably know this oh, yeah. pretty well, but we subsidize our agriculture. And when we subsidize agriculture, we're not subsidizing, you know, like small organic farmers. I, <laughs> I even, I even mean like, you know, you, all your, your listeners probably know Joel Salatin, who's actually in poverty Inc. So, right. um, but you know, Salatin has that great book called everything I want to do is illegal. <laughs> well, all right, because it's not as if like Salatin, who's not a really, he's not a small farmer. I mean, he's doing pretty impressive things. But there's all these regulations that make it hard for even for, for domestic farmers, mm -hmm. right? But so those things also, so we, so, but we subsidize our, our farmers, or at least big agriculture. We overproduce. And then we take the surplus and we either send it as aid or we rig tariffs and we dump it on their economies. Okay, that, then... We say, oh my goodness, competition and markets really hurt the poor. Mm -hmm. We've got to, we've got to protect the poor, and so we try to regulate markets. Well, of course, who do you think does the regulation, right? <laughs> Big businesses, powerful right. interest groups, and, and entrenched bureaucracy, yeah. right? So, so you have this crony capitalism developing. Developing. So we send our, we send it over, and then we disempower local farmers, and so we actually put farmers out of business by so-called trying to help them, and these negative consequences, you know, have been going on for years. The other thing that aid does is that it politicizes development, it politicizes the economy, and it politicizes life. And so instead of having like people in communities buying and selling and working, you actually have this kind of highly centralized technocratic approach uh, where everybody's looking to the government or the aid agencies to kind of get a piece of this, this very limited pie, instead of having a, an understanding of kind of the ability to grow an economy. Right. And, and so one of the problems, of course, is that, you know, we say, well, why do we do that? Well, and this is par partially why we call it Poverty Inc., that poverty is an industry, and like other industries, it wants to stay in business. Now, I want to say, I don't believe that most people who work in Poverty Inc. are bad, okay? <laughs> We're uh -huh. really clear about that, right? And, and, and you know, I can, even, I can even talk about why we don't use kind of drastic exam like drastic examples where you know big corruption is going on and the reason we don't is because if i like we talk about orphans right uh -huh. or we talk about agriculture and if they said well somebody you know they stole it or they poisoned it or they trafficked the orphans or there's these, these all these kind of kind of dramatic stories but those are you know one small kind of aberration or one small abuse or corruption of the system mm -hmm. and what we're trying to say in poverty inc is Act, actually when it's done well when good people are involved it still has negative consequences on poor people because the underlying system the underlying framework is broken and so that's that's what we're doing so yeah. we're not we're not ad hominem attacks we're not challenging the good intentions of people mm -hmm. right um, we're trying to show that the incentives are broken and so here's an example the, the guardian newspaper reported that out of a billion dollars in agricultural food aid, 700 million, that's 70%, went to three large companies. Wow. So, so we're, we have to ask ourselves, like, what's the purpose of foreign aid? Now, many people who are pro-foreign aid will say, you know, don't you care? Of course I care. Right. 
what's the purpose of foreign aid? Is the purpose of foreign aid to build American companies or European companies? Is it to create markets or is it to actually help build a commercial society so that so that poor countries can create prosperity for themselves mm-hmm. and we don't have to be dependent? And, and this is kind of if, if the purpose is the second, then I think we have to put into question some of the way uh, we think about foreign aid. Yeah. So what's the solution here? Well, I mean, that's obviously a difficult question. Yeah. You know, you, you know they, what do they say with economists? Uh, if you have two economists, they give you three opinions. Oh, yes, of course. Right. So we're talking about economics and, you know, philosophy here. <laughs> Philosophers give you like six opinions. You know, I don't think there's a single solution. But I would say, I mean, there is ways of thinking to think differently. And I said, I think one of those comes back to the question of inclusion for the poor. Mm, right? And this is what yeah. I talked a little bit about before. So I'd say, look, there's no single solution to poverty. Poverty is deeply complex. But I think one of the things that we have to talk about for poor people is this, this thing of inclusion. And I said that poor people are not poor because they lack stuff. Poor people are poor primarily in the developing world mm-hmm. right, because they lack these access to the institutions of justice. And right. so let me, I talked about them before. Let me go back to what I mean. Okay. So one of them would be clear title to land. Oh yes. So now in some countries in the you know, developing world, 60, 70% of the land has no clear title. Hmm. So if you don't know who owns the land you live on, you have no incentive to build it up, not to build a factory, not to plant an orchard or a vineyard. Right. right? I mean, I mean, that, that takes a long time. To, and I was actually, so I was thinking about this. I was in you know, my little tiny vineyard. I was walking there and I thought, I would never plant a vineyard if I, if I knew this could be taken away. Right, because exactly. Because it takes three to five years for you to start getting fruit. And, you know, orchards are intergenerational things. So, so if, you, you, if you put it in a context that, you know, you and your under, with all of us and your listeners understand, mm-hmm. like you're not going to make investments in improving your property or doing some permaculture project if it can be taken away from you and you don't, you don't know who owns it. So right. just clear title to land is essential. And, you know, of course, building business, building factories, all these other things. The other problem that's the institution of justice is just access to justice in the courts. I already mentioned it just takes a long time to get your right. court case heard. It's often very expensive. And if you're poor, if you're a widow, if you're an orphan, you're really locked out. Mm-hmm. Another thing that we take for granted that's really a problem is the participation in the formal economy. And what I mean by that is just the ability to register your business. Mm. And these are all kind of related, right? So like you yeah. register your business, you know the land, you, if something happens, if somebody rips you off, you can go to court, et cetera. So in our, in our film, in, in uh, Poverty Inc., we tell the story of Hernando de Soto uh, is a proving economist. And he tells the story, he, he said, okay, I wanna figure out how, how what does it take for a poor person to be participating in the formal economy? So he set up a little sewing machine shop about five kilometers outside of Lima, Peru, just two sewing machines. And he got four student lawyers and he said, okay, I want you guys to go around and follow all the rules and regulations. Oh. Public transportation, mm-hmm. no, you know, no white SUVs, or public transportation, do exactly like a poor person and I want you to register the business formally. How long do you think it took? Oh my gosh! Um, I, at least months. Two hundred and eighty-nine days. Wow! So two hundred and eighty-nine days it took just to register the business. Uh-huh. So at Desoto puts like the legal systems are simply unfriendly to poor people. Yeah. And then just the ability of free exchange, like ability to participate in exchange and exchange your goods. And actually, sometimes this shocks people because they say like, you know, they say, well, wait a minute. Free exchange. I mean, is that capitalism? Doesn't 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 that hurt the poor? Mm-hmm. Now, capitalism is a very complex word. I mean, like, you know, there's crony capitalism, there's managerial capitalism. So, like, capitalism. It, it, in order to discuss that, you know, you need like five podcasts, right? <laughs> exactly. So, so, but but what I'm talking about is free exchange. You know, because crony capitalism is a serious serious problem of with from foreign aid. It's a, it's a problem across the board. But when I say free exchange, I mean it's the ability to buy and sell goods without undue government influence or or you know you know, organized crime or anything like this. Now, here's why free exchange is so important. When an economy becomes highly regulated, uh-huh. who do you think writes the regulations? The government. Well, bi- yeah, government, big business, and powerful interest groups. Uh-huh. And so the poorest of the poor lack the political, economic, and social contacts 
that are necessary to navigate the system dominated by this bureaucracy. Yeah. yeah. And so that's why they need to be able to participate in the economy. And so, like, you know, one thing you do, and you, we, one thing we learned as we were doing a lot of interviews, we did about 200 interviews for this project, and people say, like, look, stop sending us stuff. Let us compete. Let us participate in your in your economy. Uh-huh. Right. And uh, one person explained it this way. He's actually done a lot of work in agriculture, and he said, you know, the famous line, give a man a fish he eats for a day, teach a man to fish he eats for a lifetime. Right. He said, you know what? Most people know how to fish. Right. What they lack is access to the pond. And, and of that's, course. Part, that's part of the problem. And so one of the problems with foreign aid and charity and all these things, but especially government to government aid, foreign aid to government to government aid, is that it actually creates incentives for local governments not to build these institutions of justice because you don't you don't need a tax base. You don't need a commercial society. You don't need a healthy, developed local economy if you're getting funded from ex- from outside. Right. Right. And so that's part of the problem. And so like and I think like, you know, you and I were talking before the show started about the importance of free exchange. Let's put in an area where, you know, we where we talked about and where listeners can understand is what a farmer's market is. Right. A right. farmer's market, a pretty unregulated economy. Yep. Right? The market, people go in and they exchange their goods and services. You don't have thousands of regulations. You know, there's there's trust built. It's it's right. These things are lacking, you know, as a long for long term. Now, I'm not saying there are no markets in the developing world. Obviously, there's lots right. of markets. You know, there's tons of markets, but there's a difference between a market and then being able to operate with long term planning. Right. And those so that so what's lacking is a commercial society. And so a lot of our aid, a lot of our assistance, a lot of our charity, stops that commercial society. And then prevents kind of economic independence and prosperity in their own communities. Yeah, I think that's the bottom line of it right there. Is we're crippling yeah. these economies. And I, right, and I think that, and and you know, I think this goes back to that philosophical point. Right, mm-hmm. like, like human, poor people are, are 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 persons. Right, they're not somehow radically different from us. Right, and what happens is, what we do is we allow their difference their poverty or their, you know, ethnicity or their different nationality, their difference to come in front of their identity as a human person. Yeah. And so we end up treating them like objects. And, you know, it's it's done a lot of it's done a lot of harm. And and the problem the other problem is it's it's really emotionally satisfying to do that. And this is this is the this is the challenge. So in many ways, so this has been kind of interesting about our film. Mm-hmm. I, probably ten years ago, I was making these arguments. People, you know, it was very hard to make. Other people were too. I'm not the only one. Right. right. Uh, um, there are a lot of people doing this, but it always seemed mean spirited. Oh, well, don't you care about poor people? You know, exactly. Poor exactly. People? And 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 this idea, like, well, yeah, but they're dying now. Like, okay, well, if it's an emergency, we have to do something. But if it's if it's a chronic problem, then we have to think about how to solve that. But I think one of the things that was Good, and I think in our film and other things that are other other people doing this is it was interesting to hear from people in Africa, Latin America, you know, et cetera, Asia, explain. Well, this is what's happening to us, and this is why it's a problem. Yeah, and I think that that was helpful. But I think the other the other challenge, and we you know we deal a little bit with celebrities. We try mm-hmm. to be gentle, Bono and other people, <laughs> right? But, but you know, the kind of humanitarian, compassionate care, like we've got to do something now, you know. Like we are the world, or you know, mm-hmm. this stuff. It's it's very appealing to us. Like it, it kind of it, it gratifies our 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 desire to do something. It gra- it it makes us feel like we're helping. And so, part of what I'm saying and what we're saying in the film is we're not saying don't care, and don't help, but it's important that poor people are the protagonists of their own story of development yeah. and that we don't socially engineer them. And I mean, I think if you think again, to kind of put it in the context of, of thinking about farming and thinking about like communities and how, how problems are solved, you know, one of the things that the urban farmers, small farmers are trying to do are trying to kind of work out solutions or they're very effective, very efficient solutions right. without having like kind of like the technocratic uh, industrial models just put on people. Mm-hmm. You know, industrial models are not always wrong, but but when they're used inappropriately, we're using the wrong thing. Yeah, they can actually do harm. And so this is what we've done. We've used an industrial model for for trying to help the poor. I mean, it's the same thing with my view on education. We we've, we've used this kind of 
factory industrial model for education and it's failing a lot of people. Yeah. And so what happens is sometimes a big problem doesn't actually require a top down industrial solution. It requires different ways of thinking and mm -hmm. different ways of participation and access. Yeah. And that's what we're trying to get across in our film so that it, it it's obviously, you know, it's a critique of crony capitalism for sure. It's a critique of, of a certain type of humanitarianism, social engineering, but it's also trying to challenge and help people to kind of think about different ways of solving the problem instead of merely this uh, kind of top-down industrial model. Yeah. So and that movie is called Poverty, Inc., and we can find that at where? Well, it's on Netflix, on iTunes, and Amazon. You nice. can also find it at povertyinc.org. You can learn about it. If you want to mm -hmm. host a screening, like at a community screening or a school, uh -huh. uh, we, we do that as well. Uh, but if you just want to watch it, you can see it um, tonight on Netflix. On Netflix. Or, uh, or on Amazon or iTunes. Nice. You know, before we shift, I, there's one quote that I, that I want to read, um, and I want you to just comment on it briefly because it's, it's powerful. And you, you quote in the movie, the reason there will be no change is because the people that stand to lose the most have all the power, and the people who stand to gain some things have none of the power. Right. In many ways, uh, Mike Fairbank says at the beginning of the movie, in mm -hmm. many ways, that's that is a theme uh, of Poverty Inc. Right. Mm -hmm. It's that what's happened is that we I don't I don't think this was the intention, but we've created this industrial social engineering model mm -hmm. to help poor people. And where's all the power located? It's all located in the poverty industry. And so. If poor people are given access, if they're given opportunity to clear title to land, ability to participate in the formal economy, access to justice, the courts, ability to participate in free exchange, they're going to create prosperity in their own communities. They're yeah. not going to need the poverty industry, right? And and so right. part of what we're saying is that there's actually an incentive on behalf of the pop on the side of the poverty industry to not do the very things that are most important because both the poverty industry and like local I mean, you know, countries in the developing world, the political mm -hmm. class in the developing world, they will, in one sense, lose. Now, in the long run, they're, they're going to gain. I think countries are going to become more wealthy and there's less violence, et cetera. But in the long, in the long run, I, maybe not less violence, but less sickness and longer life expectancy. Yeah. Um, uh, violence is a different complex issue. But in the, in the short run, the people who, with the power, the people in the political class are mm -hmm. going to are going to lose out. And yeah. that's both the poverty industry and people in the political class of the of the developing world. I mean, so here's something that I, I sometimes will give as an example of, of why these institutions matter. Uh -huh. Oftentimes, if you ask people, what do poor people need in order to get wealthy? They will say things like education, healthcare, and infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Now, Greg, all of those things are important. Right. Okay. They, they all matter. Education matters, right? But let's take education. But first of all, but all those things are a result of wealth before they become the cause of wealth. Hmm. Broad, widespread education, healthcare, and infrastructure that benefits lots of people are the result of wealth first. Hmm. Then right. they become a cause of wealth, right? So let me give you an example why. Let's say you're highly educated, okay? You've got skills, ambitions, talents, you're highly educated, but you can't own property. You don't yeah. know who and you live on. Yep. You can't participate in the formal economy and you can't get access to justice in the courts. Well, what are you going to do? I would say you've got three things you're going to do. Either you're going to despair, mm -hmm. right? Right. And Herman Henry Hesse, he's a Ghanaian entrepreneur in a film. He says, look, you're stuck in a hole with all your skills and talents and that's unfortunately the way it is, right? So you're either going to despair or you're going to migrate or you're going to join the political class. Right to get a share of this kind of broken social engineering approach, and so while all these things are important, education, healthcare, and infrastructure, what's most important is to create inclusion and people access yeah. to justice, and and then we don't need to be the hero because people are going to solve their own problems. And yeah, you know, at the end of the film, Herman Chinder Hesse kind of makes that point. He says, like, we have to sink or swim ourselves. He's a Ghanaian entrepreneur. Well, and that's even the case for us here in our in economy. You know, I, I run Urban Farm U. I have to sink or swim on my own. Right, right. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So so that's the cut. So the idea really is that that we really wanted to challenge the social engineering, this kind of objectification, mm-hmm. and 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 rethink it. And so a lot of people will say, "What should I do?" I do in mm. my own community. And I have like Greg, I have the worst answer. I mean, this <laughs> is not to make me any money. I'll tell you. But I say I don't know. And the reason I don't know is, I don't know the situation you're in. Right. I don't know the. I don't know the the needs of the people that you're trying to help, and so our goal is really to create a framework of thinking, yeah. right? And and how how to kind of rethink some of our ideas and and um, and some of our kind of approaches to things. And oftentimes they get stuck in certain categories, right, left, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And part of what we're doing is we're not, you know, we're not operating within those categories. We're we're challenging kind of underlying assumptions. Yeah. And and in that way, it's the the call to action, as it were, is to think differently. And then hopefully people will come up with be- you know much better, better, solutions better solutions than I could ever provide them. Beautiful. Povertyinc.org. You can check in there or you can watch it on Netflix tonight. So I'm going to shift on you and I'd like for you to talk about a time you failed, how you overcame that failure and what you might have learned from it. Golly. <laughs> failure. There's so many things that I failed. Okay. That's the beautiful thing. This is, you know, this is how we yeah. advance our football, right? Totally. Failure is great. So, like one of my one of my children, I'm going to sound like I'm a bad father. But one of my children said, "Daddy, I, I'm not. I'm bad violinist because they're studying violin." Uh-huh. I said, "You're not even bad yet." Oh, oops. <laughs> You're just learning, right? Right. And so it's this kind of idea somehow that I'm either good or bad at it. Oh, You're not yeah. good or bad at the violin at all. Right. You're just, you're just learning the violin, and if you practice hard and you you st- and you and you you learn from your failures and mm-hmm. you get up when you're feeling discouraged, you'll become good at the violin. Yeah. And if you, if you um, don't practice, then you'll never become good at the violin. But in order to be bad at the violin, you got to at least, you know, learn it. And I think, yeah, so this, this kind of idea somehow that, that, uh, yeah, we're good or bad at things uh, too early on is a problem. Oh, yeah. Uh, totally. I mean, I failed so many times. I would say, you know, I guess, I, I maybe I mentioned this earlier. Kind of made I made a joke about it, you know. Earlier, um, I don't usually talk about this, but I I, I um, didn't. I was a terrible student uh-huh. in, in undergraduate. Oh right. And I just didn't study, and I I failed a lot. Right. And and I remember, you know, basically, you know, telling I, they said, "You're you're, you're out of here. <laughs> you're such a bad student." Yeah. And so I was out of Notre Dame, and then I was able to go back in. You know, I got back in, and I graduated. I finished, but I I failed, and I and I. It was kind of a moment where you, you, I realized like you, either you're gonna work or not. Yeah. yeah. Either you're gonna commit yourself to something and suffer through learn, you know, something mm-hmm. that takes work or not. And so I actually, so I failed a lot of things. I failed Japanese, for example. I got an F in Japanese. It was a five credit course. Talk about. Oh my gosh. Your grade. Oh yeah, it was terrible. Yeah. So I, I ended up going to Japan. And then I became, you know, conversationally fluent in Japan, and I graduated from a, a, a Japanese, you know, good university mm-hmm. uh, with, with excellent grades. And it, it was a, a kind of a realization, like that that a lot of it is work. You know, yeah. are you willing to put the the time in? Right. And I still, I probably still haven't learned that lesson enough. I think that's that's one of the where I where I failed. And I think just related to that, maybe in the idea of learning. Speaking, of, actually, it's exact. This is great for your for your uh, podcast, because um, I remember we were trying to get. Uh, I said we're going to learn how to farm a little bit. So we're right. Oh yeah. And my wife and I were like, okay, we're going to do it. And 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 it, we were having this conversation. Like, so we got we planted a garden. It's like everything died except for kale. I'm like a professional kale grower. Nice. Okay? So, but everything else like doesn't work. And. We tried it again, didn't work. You know, we ordered topsoil, and you know what they delivered? They delivered the. It was like construction soil with pieces of glass in it. Yep. <laughs> the nothing grows in that. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah, that is the case. And then I, then I planted the garden in, in the in the wrong spot. I thought it was sunny, but it turned out it was all shady. Uh huh. And so I said, next year I'm gonna plant another spot. So I planted in in a in a, a really sunny spot, but um, it ended up flooding. So I wrote a haiku about it. <laughs> uh, let me see if I can remember since haiku is short. I said, <laughs> spring garden follies. I remember spring garden follies should have been a rice patty. Thank God for markets. Right? <laughs> that was my, there was my haiku. Anyway, so then we moved to this other place. We started doing, and things, you know, animals are killing everything. And I remember it was this moment of learning. Like, look, you're either going to learn. It's like related to the violin, yep. study or whatever. You, you're going to fail 
And if you think you're good at something or naturally good at something, obviously some people are nat you might have a natural inclination or, or kind of skill at certain things. But generally speaking, for every human being, if you, you know, within a certain range, obviously it's within a certain range, what really, what really takes is kind of work, trial and error, and not giving up. And I think that's, that's probably my, my, my lesson about not giving up. So. Amen. Yeah, amen to that. One more story. Oh, please. I, I, maybe, I don't know why I'm telling you this, but you know what? So I got, just like three weeks ago, I went to the University of Notre Dame, and I guest lectured in the classroom where I had freshman philosophy mm. 30 years ago. So that was kind of fun because, you know, I, I wasn't a good student. And then next thing you know, I was debating this lady in front of 300 people, and I was guest lecturing. And so that was maybe uh, from a failure to, to that, uh, a, good, a good kind of uh, turnaround at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So what do you consider your biggest success? Oh, golly. I married well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll tell you what, that makes all the difference in the world. I did too. So oh, yeah, people don't even say to me, like, where's your better half? They're like, where's your better seven eights? <laughs> there you go. There you go. So what drives you? Oh, golly, Greg. I take truth seriously i try to take truth seriously mm -hmm. truth and and beauty and goodness and and that doesn't mean i'm not i'm not trying to be pious i'm saying like mm -hmm. like really trying to say like is this true or not right and i mean we live in a, in a in a world where you know generally you know relativism is kind of accepted it's easy like you know relativism and beauty or relativism and in, in morality or relativism uh -huh. or whatever it's like oh you know good, everybody can disagree and it's kind of a boring way out. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't actually take seriously the complexity of human life, the magnificence of, of, of you know, human beings mm -hmm. and how unique and unrepeatable each one of us is. Mm -hmm. And so I would say like this, uh, what maybe drives me is this kind of desire to seek after truth and then try to communicate it and then to wrestle with it with other people mm. and, and, and then to hopefully change your life when when it strikes you right yeah. when you're hit by when you're hit by something beautiful and good and true it is to say you. okay i what am i how is this going to affect me and yeah. I, I remember i remember you know in the short we, we used to i used to teach intro to philosophy we i would always say to the students shock them i said i don't think beauty is subjective alone i think it's partially subjective but i'll think it's objective and they would say like they thought i was crazy mm -hmm. and i came to this point like well if you see a beautiful landscape or hear a beautiful piece of music and it's simply your opinion, well, that's boring. But if you're actually looking at something and it's actually meaning something and it, it's having an impact on me or you, now, you, maybe I'm wrong about that. And maybe by listening to you, my soul can expand. I can, I can learn something else. I can see something I've never seen before. But if it's simply just, you know, oh, it's just, a, you know, in the eye of the beholder, it's just your own opinion. I mean, this, this I think, cheapens human life. And, and it takes the most fundamental questions in life, beauty, truth, goodness, love, compassion, hope, friendship, and it just kind of it trivializes them. Mm -hmm. And so I'd say this, this um, desire for this kind of taking truth seriously is probably the thing that drives me, I guess. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So I'm all about education and, and I have to know, and I'm... A little bit hesitant to ask you this question, but is there a book or two out there that have uh, has impacted your life? Golly, well, I have a reading list. So at michaelmathesonmiller.com, there's a section called books I like, and I have like you know, there's probably about a hundred there, but I have uh, it's probably more. Well, you got to pick lot, one. There's a lot of them. You know, I'll pick. Uh, there's so many of them, but there's one, but there's one that I, I when I used to assign all the time, and I I, I read again and again. Um, it's a book by C.S. Lewis. Um, he's the guy who wrote the Chronicles of Narnia. Yep. Um, but he wrote a book, a little book. It's actually a treatise on education. So it's probably, if I have to pick one, one book, that's one of them. Uh, a treatise on education called The Abolition of Man. And it's a, it's a book about education. It's a book about actually some of the things I was just talking about. Mm -hmm. And he talks about, you know, honor and truth and beauty and goodness and how to think. And that's a, that's a very beautiful book. And then... I guess another book that's influential in the film, kind of surprisingly, is a book called Love and Responsibility. It's actually about human love. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it's by Carol Wojtyla, 
who later became John Paul II, but he wrote this when he was a, a cardinal, a Polish cardinal uh -huh. and a philosopher. Uh -huh. And the book is actually, it's, a, it's, it's really about um, the subjective dimension of a human person and how human beings are not objects to be used or manipulated and that the proper response to a human person is love. And that's a, hmm. that, that in many ways shaped the way uh, it shaped a lot of Poverty Inc. Yeah, um, it's obviously not in Poverty Inc. <laughs> there's no, there's no, not there. But it's it's it shapes this this kind of idea that, and same with Abolition of Man, that human beings are are not simply to be manipulated. And if yeah. you look at the 20th century and even now in the 21st century, a certain millions of people were were murdered because of some ideology. We're going to do something. We're going to you know we're going to solve social justice we're going to solve the world's mm -hmm. problems and and millions of people were treated as things or as obstacles and and they were destroyed and families destroyed and um love you know marriages and you know people their, their loved ones were dead mm -hmm. because of this kind of technological technocratic engineering of people and people are not things People are not right. cogs in machines. And those two books, Love and Responsibility and Abolition of Man by C.S. Lewis, are anecdotes to this kind of yeah. crass utilitarian use of human beings. Mm -hmm. uh, so those I, those are two of them. Wow. I've well, gotten far, trust me. <laughs> yeah, no, I got it. And, it, and it, it, it really sums up, those two books really sum up our conversation today. I can see that them as a thread all the way through our conversation and really what it looks like through your life. Well, I hope so. I yeah. try. Yeah. <laughs> I try. You Yay. have to see my family. Like, he tries. Well, he tries. Yeah. <laughs> so what one final piece of advice do you have for our listeners? To kind of recognize the kind of unique and unrepeatable nature of yourself and of mm. others. And then to try to respond in that way to others. I think that's it. And I think yeah. and other other advice, I mean, like, you know, I, I guess take truth seriously, like engage yeah. with it, wrestle with it, even if it doesn't make you happy, even if it challenges your political or, or, or social opinions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, I always joke, I don't have friends to lose, so I can have a, a <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can have unfashionable opinions, but I think, um, you know, I think just take, you know, seek after the truth and um, that'd be my advice. I don't know. And then uh, try to live well and uh, and love well, too, it sounds like. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the show and sharing your experience with us today, Michael. It has been a treat getting to chat with you. Greg, thanks for having me. It's been a, a, a pleasure to be on your show. Yeah. I'm very excited to, to listen to more of your uh, your your podcast about the urban farm. Thanks. Keep growing mine. Thanks, thanks, thanks. So how can our listeners get a hold of you? So I'm a research fellow at the Acton Institute. It's acton.org. Mm -hmm. uh, you can find the film at povertyinc.org. And then you can find my personal website is Michael Matheson Miller. Dot com. Perfect. With your extensive reading list. <laughs> That's you, right. You can find show notes from today's podcast at urbanfarm.org backslash poverty inc. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for joining us on the Urban Farm Podcast. Did you know the best seeds for your garden don't come from the nursery? In fact, the seeds that will create the most robust and delicious fruits and vegetables come directly from your garden. This is because they are uniquely adapted to your growing conditions, better than anything you can buy from a fancy catalog or website. Through the magic of seed saving, it is quite possible to have the garden of your dreams. The best part is, saving your own seeds is surprisingly easy and fun. With a bit of instruction, anyone can become a seed-saving superstar. Let us teach you how in our free seed-saving webinar. Just text SEEDS to 33444 to sign up or visit SeedSavingHacked.org for more information. That's SEEDS to 33444 or visit SeedSavingHacked.org. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen three days a week for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.